RJ Short Story. Studio present Win For You Stories by Rose Lane Joseph. Read by Chris from Eleven Labs. You see, I come from a very traditional background, raised with strong values that emphasize waiting until marriage for physical intimacy, a choice I've always adhered to. I'm also a reserved individual, never one to seek the spotlight. During my college years, I played as the quarterback, a position that naturally attracts a lot of attention from the opposite sex. However, due to my steadfast beliefs, I didn't experience the same romantic pursuits as some of my teammates. When I got the opportunity to join the NFL after being drafted, I was eager to prove myself as a starting quarterback and showcase my skills. I believe I performed exceptionally well, but the starting position went to Jake instead of me. I have immense respect for Jake. He's incredibly talented. Although I didn't attain the position I aspired to, I'm grateful to be working in a field I'm passionate about. However, I do yearn to be on the field more, rather than remaining on the bench, waiting for an opportunity. I've been a backup quarterback for three years now, and I'm beginning to consider the possibility of being traded to another team. Our team reached the playoffs last year, but we fell short of making it to the Super Bowl. I can't help but wonder about my future. If I were to be traded and given the chance to start, it would be fantastic. But if not, perhaps it's not meant to be. As I mentioned before, I haven't been the center of romantic attention, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I believe I'm an attractive guy, but I hold certain values that not everyone I meet is willing to uphold. They often choose a different path, and this has led me back to a situation similar to my college days. What truly frustrates me is when people can't understand my choices and start making baseless assumptions. It's baffling that just because I've chosen to abstain from casual relationships, Everyone assumes I must be gay. I'm 27 years old and I'm in no hurry to get married. I did date a girl during my first year in the NFL, but our relationship ended after six months because I wasn't in the spotlight enough for her and I expressed my desire to remain abstinent until marriage. There was another girl I had feelings for, but because I refused to have intimate relations and engage in certain activities, she left as well. Since then, I haven't dated anyone else. I won't succumb to the pressure to marry or engage in casual encounters to prove myself to others. My teammates, well-intentioned as they may be, often try to set me up with various girls, but it has rarely worked out. It's become evident that many of these girls are merely looking for an opportunity, and I've found that some of them couldn't even hold a decent conversation. There were two exceptions that piqued my interest, and I went on separate dates with each of them. I must say, the experience was quite challenging. It's disheartening to date people from the younger generation who have different values and expectations. Melissa, whom I considered pursuing, revealed on our third date that she was bisexual, which was a deal breaker for me. So I turned to my second choice, but she was too liberal for my liking, which led me to block her. At this point, I decided to take a break from dating. However, someone from my team started to speculate that my difficulty in maintaining a relationship was due to my sexuality. None of them ever bothered to ask me directly. They simply assumed. Etienne, an old friend from college, was the only one who had the courage to confront me about the rumors. I felt that my personal life was not their concern, so I never provided a straightforward answer. If they wanted to speculate, I was content to leave them guessing. However, the most unexpected event occurred when they invited me to a get-together. As I arrived at the party, Dante introduced me to a guy named Charlie and said, Hey, I want you to meet Charlie. He's a fun guy who will keep you on your toes. I was somewhat skeptical as I'm not a fan of such gatherings. Yet, since I wasn't dating anyone and was looking to get out more, I found myself at the house, attending a gathering to socialize. With all my family residing in Arizona, I often felt lonely here in this new place. Charlie, who was sharing stories and details that didn't particularly interest me, was beginning to irritate me. So I decided to seek refuge in a conversation with the group of girls who always brought an element of wild energy to these parties. They seemed to be up for anything, and honestly, I preferred their company to Charlie's. Little did I know that Charlie was gay, and the others were trying to set us up. I discovered this when I excused myself to use the bathroom. Upon exiting, I overheard Charlie talking to one of the guys who had invited him, saying, 
I don't think Logan is interested because he keeps brushing me off. With this revelation, I made a swift exit. I walked out, glanced at them both, and headed straight to my car, leaving the party immediately. The following day, Etienne called and asked if I wanted to hang out and play Madden. I wasn't in the mood for more matchmaking attempts, and replied, look, if you and the guys are trying to play matchmaker, I'm not interested. No, man, that was Dante's idea. I had nothing to do with it, he responded. Despite my initial reluctance, I decided to go anyway. When I arrived, I knocked on the door and a woman answered. Hi, is Etienne there? I inquired. No, he stepped out. Can I help you? She asked. He invited me to come over. Can I come in? I replied. Hold on a second, she said, closing the door. A few minutes later, she reopened it with her phone in her hand and inquired about my name. After confirming, she hung up the phone and opened the door wider to let me in. I didn't recognize her, but I couldn't help but notice her. She was wearing black tights and a white tank top with flip-flops. And I casually asked, are you Etienne's new girlfriend? She smiled and replied, oh, God, no, I'm his aunt. Aunt? Aren't you too young to be his aunt? I teased. No, I can be your mother, she replied, closing the door behind me. I chuckled. Yeah, right, you can't be that old. She had her hair twisted with rubber bands, and I assumed she was around 23. Yeah, I'm that old, Logan. I'm 40, so I can be your mother. What? You're 13 years older than me, and now you think you can be my mother? I playfully retorted. She smiled and apologized. Okay, you're right. I'm sorry. Apology accepted. So are you visiting or have you just moved here? I inquired. I'm thinking about moving here, she replied. I think you should. I can show you around on my days off, I offered. She smiled and shared, look, Logan, you're cute, but I don't think I'm the right fit for you. Whoa, whoa, wait, woman, pump your brakes. First of all, cute is not appropriate to address a grown man. I think I passed the cute stage back when I was a teenager. Secondly, I wasn't asking you out. I think you're reading too deeply into this conversation. I only offered to show you around as a friendly gesture, I clarified. Again, I'm sorry. Stupid me, right? I have to put my foot in my mouth again. You know what? Why don't you make yourself at home? I'll be right back, she said before walking away. About 10 minutes later, she returned in a long navy blue dress with white stripes, looking elegant. I was glad she chose something more appropriate. She asked me if I wanted something to drink, and I requested water. She went to the kitchen, and the doorbell rang. I answered the door, and Thomas Kai and Jason were there. They saw her and assumed she was with me leading Kai to say, oh, you brought a date? I smiled at Rory, turning to look at her and then closed the door. She brought the water to me and I thanked her. Thomas couldn't help but comment, why didn't you tell us you had a girlfriend? Some of us thought you were, you know, on the other side, dude. Jason chimed in, aren't you going to introduce us to your beautiful girlfriend? Realizing I didn't even know her name, she kindly introduced herself saying, hi guys, I'm Rory, nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, Rory, do you have a sister? Jason asked with a playful grin. Rory replied, yeah, she's married with children. Jason continued in jest. Well, you can always dump Logan and be with me. He's still a virgin and I'm experienced. She looked at me, smiled and said, I'll take my chances with him. I remained silent, sitting down with a smirk on my face. Thomas, curious, asked, where's Etienne? I replied, he stepped out. He'll be back shortly. Rory excused herself momentarily, returned with her purse, and said, Babe, can I talk to you for a few minutes outside? I got up to follow her outside, and she addressed the guys, saying, It was nice meeting you guys. Kai couldn't resist a parting comment. Oh, why are you leaving us so soon? Rory responded, I have to run some errands. Besides, I don't want to ruin your bro's time together. Oh, be nice to my boyfriend, will you? Before we walked outside. As we reached her car, I couldn't help but tease her. I thought you weren't interested and that you're too old for me. She playfully replied, I'm not, I was just saving your ass in there. Wow, you're something else. So how long will you be playing my girlfriend, I asked. Well, you can tell them that we just broke up. I chuckled. No, I'm not breaking up with you. She giggled and suggested, look, I have to go. Will you keep an eye on them until Etienne gets back? I inquired, where are you going? 
I'm going to the store if that's okay with you, love. Thomas and Kai appeared at the door with Kai asking, is everything all right? I glanced at them before turning my attention back to Rory, saying, you have to kiss me goodbye, babe. She responded, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Of course I would. You're my girlfriend, remember? Maybe when I get back, virgin man, but don't wait up for me, she said before getting into her car. I couldn't resist adding, yeah, I love you too. I stood there and watched her drive out of the driveway before returning inside. The guys were curious about how I'd met her, and I simply explained, we just met recently. Thomas, ever the inquisitive one, prodded, you're going to sleep with her, right? I chose to ignore the question, but deep down, I realized I was developing feelings for Rory. I wondered how I could tell Etienne that I was falling for his aunt. I had no idea how he would react. In any case, I needed to find a way to get closer to her. What intrigued me was that when Etienne finally got home, the guys told him that my new girlfriend had come by, leaving him in surprise as he asked, you got a girlfriend? Kai couldn't help but comment, yeah, man, and she is fine. He better tap that, otherwise I will beat him myself. Sitting there, I was secretly hoping they wouldn't mention her name. Etienne, inquisitive as ever, asked, what's her name? Jason answered, Rory. I noticed Etienne's silence after hearing her name, and that's when I realized she had given them a fake name. Etienne broke the silence, asking, that's nice, man. Is she coming back here? I replied, no, she just stopped by to pick something up from me. I decided to stay a bit longer, hoping to meet her again. As I walked out the door to go to my car, she pulled up. I approached her and she teasingly said, I see you waited for me. You want that kiss, don't you? I grinned and replied, oh, you have no idea. I had to see you before I go to bed, my love. That's sweet. Well, good night, Logan, she said. I pretended to search for my phone and said, oh, I think I dropped my phone. Where were you last with it, she asked. I don't know, can I see your phone, I requested. Sure, she replied and handed me her phone. I dialed my number and let it ring until it went to my voicemail. I then walked to my car, retrieved my phone from my pocket and got out of the car. I handed her the phone and asked, thanks, wait, what's your name again? She chuckled and said, I thought I told you earlier. No, you didn't. You gave the guys a name, but you didn't tell me your real name. Mmm. You catch on quick, huh? Yep, so what's your real name, Rory? She smiled and revealed, it's Candace. Nice name, I like it. Have a good night, Candace, I said before walking to my car. Once I got to my car, I saved her number in my phone. The following day during practice, I was talking to Etienne, and he mentioned that he wasn't comfortable with his aunt living with him because he occasionally brought different girls home and wanted some privacy. This was the perfect opportunity for me, as I wanted to get to know her better. I suggested, well, I have a spare room at my apartment for rent. I wouldn't mind renting it to her. He looked at me and expressed concern. Wait, you just got a girlfriend. I don't want to put that on you. No, I was going to rent it out anyway. What about your girlfriend? Don't you need some alone time with her? I reassured him. I just met the girl. It's not like she's going to move in with me. I don't even know if it will work out anyway. Okay, I will talk to her about it. Thanks, man. I will get back to you. No problem, I replied. About a week later, Etienne came to me and said, I spoke with her and she agreed to rent the room for now. I'll bring her to your place on Friday. Is that cool? Yeah, sure. I'll be home, I confirmed. All the guys had bought big houses, but I was still living in the same two-bedroom apartment I moved into when I got drafted. I didn't want to buy a home yet until I was getting married. Interestingly, Tien hadn't told her that she would be renting the room from me. I made sure to clean the apartment before their visit. When I opened the door, she looked at Etienne and teasingly asked, hmm, did he put you up to this? Etienne quickly clarified, no, auntie. I asked him because he's the only one I could trust. And he is the first person I thought of when it came to finding a place for you to stay. I smiled and reassured her, don't worry, I won't bite. Opening the door wider, I let them in. Etienne had been to my apartment before, so I showed Candace the room she would be staying in. It was fully furnished, and all she needed to do was bring her clothes. After seeing the room, she asked, so, are there any specific rules I need to follow? 
I replied, well, just be respectful and keep the apartment clean. Candace inquired, how much rent do you want per month? I turned the question back to her, saying, how much can you afford? She considered it and then said, I can do 350 a month. Okay, that's fine, I agreed. I gave her a key to the apartment so she could move in. I was delighted that she agreed to stay with me. I hoped everything would go smoothly. We had a game with the dolphins in two days, and we were flying out late that day. I was looking forward to coming home to see her. We won the game by one point, putting us in second place in our division. It had been a tough game, but a win was a win. We returned home late on Monday night around 11.30. I couldn't wait to get back to the apartment. I arrived home at one in the morning and made sure to enter quietly. After taking a shower, I went to the kitchen to get some snacks before heading to bed. While I was standing in the kitchen about to get some cereal, Candace came out of her room. I didn't notice her because my back was turned to her door. When she reached me, she greeted me saying, hi. I quickly turned to face her and replied, hi, I hope I didn't wake you up. She assured me, no, I couldn't sleep. I smiled and teased, were you thinking about me? She responded playfully, what if I was? I flirtatiously continued, I would say that I like that. She smiled and congratulated me saying, Congrats on your win. Thank you. I didn't know you watched football, I said. She surprised me by saying, you would be amazed to know the things I like. I replied with enthusiasm. Well, I can't wait to learn about them. Candace then offered, you know there's food in the fridge, right? Would you like me to warm up some food for you? I accepted and said, sure. While she was warming up the food, she stood there looking at me as if she wanted to ask something. I noticed her expression and asked, what's on your mind? She hesitated before saying, I'm curious, you're 27 years old, handsome, successful, and single. Why is that? I flirtatiously responded, I was waiting for you. Then I turned the question back to her asking, how about you? Why aren't you married? She placed the food on the table for me along with a bottle of water and said, enjoy, I'm going to bed, good night. I was left wondering, wait, did I say something wrong? She paused and explained, no, I'm just tired. We have plenty of time to talk. Good night, Logan. I understood and wished her a good night. Okay, good night, Candace. We left it at that until a few days later, when the subject came up again. While we were sitting in the living room, relaxing, she seemed a little reluctant to discuss it. Eventually, she took a deep breath and revealed, I always wanted children. I guess it wasn't meant for me to have any. Curious, I asked, why do you say that? She looked at me and after a moment's hesitation confessed, Logan, I recently got divorced from my husband of 10 years. I was a bit surprised and responded sincerely, well, I'm not sorry he left you because I would have never met you if you were still with him. Candace grimaced and said, what if I'm not the right woman for you? How do you know that you're not the right woman for me? I don't know, she said, pausing momentarily, and then continued, what if I can't give you children? I gently placed my hand on her shoulder and said, there are always other options, Candace. She hesitated for a moment and then continued, I know, but I don't want to get hurt again. I spoke earnestly. I'm not your ex-husband, Candace. I would never hurt you. She still had doubts and asked, how do I know that you won't? I tried to ease her fears. You're just gonna have to take a leap of faith. Anyway, what happened? Was he abusive toward you? Candace began to open up about her past. He was not physically abusive, but he and his family were verbally abusive to me. She forced a smile and shared her story. When we first met, he was very sweet to me, but there was something about him that made my heart skip beats every time I was with him. I was 30 years old and I wanted to get married and have children. I wasn't really into him and I didn't like that feeling. But he impressed my mother so much that she told me it's better to have someone than no one at all. She said I could grow to love him, so I took her advice. The first year together was great and I fell in love with him. But a few years later, he started to change. He withdrew from me and my family. His mother, no matter how much I tried to please her, would always find a way to humiliate me. 
When he would take me to a get-together at his family's home, she would make comments about me not having children, and it hurt. She blatantly said to my ex-husband in front of me to divorce me because I was worthless. But she admired Leonie, my ex-husband's high school sweetheart. I found out after our divorce that she gave birth to two of his children while we were still married. I met the children, and I didn't know they were his. Candace chuckled and expressed her feelings. You know, I'm so stupid. What hurt the most is that I always supported him, even when he wanted to start his business. He told me he was working extra hours and coming home late, not knowing he was spending time with her and their children. I had to pay all the bills. Tears welled up in her eyes and she continued. He opened the business and put Leone on it, so I don't get anything. The home that I purchased before I met him, all that I had, the judge forced me to sell it and split the money 50-50 with him because we were married for 10 years, even though I paid all the bills. I expressed my sympathy, saying, God, I'm sorry you had to go through this, babe. Candace replied, yeah, me too. I encouraged her. You shouldn't let this keep you from finding happiness. She smiled, but still had her doubts. Logan, I gave this man 10 years of my life. It wasn't 10 days or 10 hours. I made a lot of sacrifices just to keep my marriage. This is not just a slap in the face. Please understand that I'm not comparing you to him. But even if I wanted to be with you, I'm 40 years old. I can't even produce the simplest thing that I was created to do, having children. What good will I be to you, Logan? What will your family think of me, besides me being 13 years older than you and Baron? I firmly stated, what if your ex-husband didn't want you to get pregnant? You can't say that you are barren because you never slept with me. And as for what my family will think, I don't care what they think of you. All we need is each other, and let me worry about your age. Candace didn't say anything, but her presence meant the world to me. I cherished her as a companion, and I loved coming home to her. I knew she cared for me, but her past had left her hesitant to open up fully. She was amazing and I could see her as a great wife and mother to my children. This woman always made sure there was cooked food in the house and would serve me without me even asking. Since she moved in with me, I never had to do laundry, and she never expected anything in return. I had fallen in love with her, and I would be a fool to let her go. We were way, had met in August during the preseason. So in mid-November, one night after having dinner and sitting in the living room, I gathered the courage to ask her, what do I have to do for you to be my girlfriend? We were already living together, and things were going well. I longed to be able to cuddle with her in bed and share kisses. She looked into my eyes for a moment and replied, Win the Super Bowl for me. I didn't anticipate this request, and confusion filled my expression as I responded, You want me to win the Super Bowl for you? She affirmed, Yes, that's what I said. Win the Super Bowl for me, and you can have me. In fact, I'll be with you the night you win and I'll be your wife. And I tried to reason with her, saying, Why the Super Bowl? It's not fair, Candace. Why not ask for something more achievable? She remained resolute, stating, I just did, Logan. I pressed on. No, you're asking me for the impossible, Candace. I'm the third-string quarterback. How am I going to win the Super Bowl for you? Candace challenged my faith. Wow, you don't even have any faith in yourself, let alone your God. You say you are a Christian, and yet you don't trust that he can do the impossible for you? Her words struck me with a sense of shame, as I admitted. But that's different. God will not do this. She questioned my certainty. How do you know that he will not? Did you ask him, and did he say no to you? Once again, her words left me speechless for a few seconds. I finally managed to respond. What if he says no? Candace delivered her verdict. Then you can't have me, Logan. She got up, walked to her room, and closed the door. I sat in silence for a good 10 minutes before I mustered the courage to knock on her door. She opened it, and I said, Okay, I will win the Super Bowl for you, but you are not allowed to see anyone else until it's over. You are mine until then. Okay, she replied. Okay, I echoed, before she closed the door. I stood there contemplating how in the world I was going to achieve this seemingly impossible task. It was essential to note that Jake, our quarterback, was performing well, and it was already mid-November. We were second in our division, just one game behind due to three losses. 
oh, the challenges this woman brought into my life. I couldn't believe I had just agreed to her condition. I retreated to my room, pondering how to bring the matter to God. When my own faith was wavering, I fell to my knees, began to pray, and said, Father, forgive me for doubting your greatness. I'm ashamed and deeply sorry for sinning against you. The thing is, I'm not sure if this request will be pleasing to you. I'm just a third-string quarterback who has been with the team for three years, and I've never had a chance or opportunity like the other guys. In fact, no one else even knows that I'm a quarterback. That's how lowly I am. I know that you can raise me up from my humble state. I acknowledge that I'm not worthy to come before you or worthy of anything. So here I am, Father, begging for your mercy. She's asked me for the most impossible task. But I come to you because nothing is impossible for you. Father, if it's your will for Candace to be my wife, please grant me this wish and allow me to win the Super Bowl for her. I promise to donate $100,000 to families in need if you permit me to win it all. Father, I love her, but if it's not your will for me to marry her, I will accept it because you know what's best for me. I just wanted to express how much I love and appreciate her living with me. I will testify to everyone about what you've done for me. Thank you for hearing my prayers. After concluding my prayer, I considered fasting from sunrise to sundown the following day, shutting off my phone and staying in my room to pray. When she realized I hadn't emerged from my room, she knocked on the door to check on me. I opened the door and she asked, are you okay? I reassured her, yes, I'm fine, before shutting the door to continue my fasting. I didn't leave my room until around seven o'clock that evening and I was famished. As soon as I came out, she walked out of her room and looked at me with suspicion as I headed for the kitchen to find something to eat. I was about to grab some food when she offered to get it for me. After setting the food on the table, she sat there gazing at me. I started eating immediately as I was ravenous, and she said, look. I interrupted her, looking into her eyes, and said, baby, I'm fine. I'm not upset with you. Please, can we not talk about it? I'm working on your request, okay? Thanks for the food, and please let me eat. I love you. Okay, she said before leaving the table. When I turned my phone back on, I found several messages that needed my attention. Our next game was at home, so during the game, I tried not to dwell on it. If God accepted my prayer, he would find a way. The game was tied in the second quarter. Five minutes before the second quarter ended, Jake was trying to make a play to put us in the lead when he got injured and broke his leg. He had to be carted off the field. I sat on the bench because I was the last guy they would call to replace him. They called Joe to finish the second quarter before halftime. When we were in the locker room, the coach made no indication that I would be playing. Besides, Joe had finished the second quarter. We came out of the tunnel, and as I was about to sit on the bench, the coach called me and said, you're going to finish the game, Logan. I stood there in disbelief, and he asked, did you hear me? Yes, sir, I replied. I won't deny I was nervous as hell, fearing that I would mess up. While I was on the sideline, I threw a few snaps, and my heart was pounding faster than normal. I couldn't believe they were sending me out there. We practiced at the facility, but it had been three years since I played in front of millions of people. I was so nervous that I started to pray. Then came the moment of truth when the other team went four and out. It was for real, and I was going out there. I was scared and excited at the same time. I couldn't afford to mess up. So when I stepped on the field, I had to gather myself. On my first drive, we went four and out, and I was sacked four times. In the second round, I started to get more comfortable, and we managed to get a field goal despite being sacked twice. We were trailing by seven points. As I got more playing time, I began to feel at ease and avoided getting sacked. Releasing the ball quickly helped, as I had already been sacked six times, and it was painful. In the fourth quarter, I started to play as I should and scored two touchdowns, putting us in the lead. At the end of the fourth quarter, the score was tied 37-37 and we went into overtime. Fortunately, we had the ball first, and a rookie, Jordan, stepped up. He hadn't caught anything I threw to him until that moment when he caught the ball and ran for 40 yards. We didn't gain any yardage on the first and second down. On third down, I threw the ball to him, and he scored a touchdown. But I was hit hard after releasing the ball. I forgot about the hit when he made the touchdown. The other team was flagged, but it didn't matter because we won the game. 
It was my first game, and I kept the ball. I only began to feel the impact of all those sacks and the final hit after the game. When I got home, it appeared that Candace had been waiting for me. As soon as I opened the door, she stood up from the sofa and asked, Are you all right? Hi, I will be, I guess. I feel like I got hit by a train, but we won, I said. She smiled and said, I know. Congratulations on your first win. Thank you. Do you want something to eat now? No, I'm going to lie down. My body is sore. Thanks, I said, as I made my way to my room. I just collapsed onto the bed in pain. It seemed like she felt bad seeing me in this state. She knocked on the door, but I didn't have the strength to get up and said, come in. She entered, knelt before me, and said, look, if you want to quit, what? I'm not a quitter. Besides, I would have played regardless because it's my job. Listen, if you are here to discourage me, please leave, I said. She got up and walked away. But she returned with a jar of cream and said, come on, take your shirt off and pants. After I took my shirt off and pants, she placed a towel over my waist. Her hands worked like magic, massaging my entire body. She then handed me warm shirts and pajamas. She brought me some water and said, try to sleep, good night. Interestingly, when I woke up, I didn't feel any pain. I took a shower, got dressed, and went to the kitchen for breakfast, where I found her cooking. I greeted her with a, good morning. Good morning, how are you feeling, she asked. I'm feeling great. What did you do? I don't feel any pain, I marveled. I just used the cream and gave you a massage. Wow, thank you. You're welcome. Are you going to eat breakfast? Can I take it to go? I don't want to be late. Okay, she said before packing it for me, and I left. When I arrived at work, the guys were looking at me strangely because I should have been walking in pain, but I wasn't. Kai asked, you don't look like you're in pain. What did you do? Oh, my girl fixed me up last night, I said proudly. Is she a massage therapist? Can she give me a massage? Kai inquired. No, get your girlfriend to do it, I replied. Even the coach approached me and said, how are you not in pain after all those sacks? My girlfriend massaged me last night, sir, I replied. He looked at me and asked, is that her specialty? I don't know, sir. I'll ask her, I replied. Okay, let me know. She could work for us, he said. That's when it hit me that Etienne doesn't know about me and his aunt. I wasn't sure how I was going to handle it, but I considered letting it go because I didn't want her to work there. Besides, I preferred her being a housewife. When I got home later that day, she was in the kitchen cooking. I placed my bag down, walked to the kitchen, looked at her and said, hi. Hi, what? She asked, looking at me. I smiled and said, my coach wants to know if you would like to work with them as a massage therapist. She paused for a minute and said, how do you feel about me working there with all these horny guys? I don't want you to work there. Okay, tell them that I'm not interested. I smiled and said, thank you. I wanted to kiss her so badly, but I held back. I must admit that the fans had many doubts about me as the team's quarterback. They posted mean comments on social media. In the last two games that we lost, some fans even threw things at me as I was going into the tunnel. I tried to avoid social media to stay focused, but some things were hard to ignore. Some of them said the season was over because I wasn't as good as Jake. I had to deal with harsh criticism, but Candace was there to support me. I won't lie, those comments hurt. It's not easy being out there on the field, especially when our division was highly competitive. The teams we played against were talented, and I needed to prove my worth. The pressure was building, and I felt it. To make matters worse, some NFL network commentators belittled me, saying we wouldn't make the playoffs because I was just a third-string quarterback. They had already written me off and dismissed our victories. It was tough, but I worked harder to prove them wrong. Candace's presence was invaluable during this challenging time. Three days before the wild card game, I embarked on another fasting, asking God for courage, strength, and help to win it all. I was nervous before the wild card game, especially since it was an away game. I threw two interceptions in the first two quarters, and we went into halftime with no score. The team seemed to lose faith in me, and I felt the pressure. I called Candace, and she answered on the first ring. I told her, baby, I feel as if the guys are giving up on me. Sweetie, you are their leader. 
They will give up only if you do. You have a lot of time left. I believe in you. You are strong and I know that you are not a quitter. You can and will win this game. Please win it for me. I'm watching the game. I love you. I love you too, Candace, I said before hanging up. I went back to the guys and delivered a motivating speech and said, I know it looks bad, but we can win this game. I know everyone is doubting us. They didn't believe that we could make the playoffs, and here we are. We are not quitters. Let's show them that we are as good as the other teams who made the playoffs. We've worked hard to get here and deserve to be here. I believe in every one of you, and we will win this game no matter what it takes. Remember, we are all we have, and we are all we need. So cancel out all the noise and doubts, and let's go out there and give them a show. We went back out there, and the other team had the ball. They went four and out punting the ball. Unluckily for us, we had to start at the two-yard line. On our first down, Etienne gained 50 yards. After three more plays, we scored a touchdown, and from there, the guys started to gain confidence. We managed to regain our confidence, and with a renewed spirit, we came from zero scores to win the game 34, 31. As the underdog, they didn't expect that, and the folks from the NFL Network weren't too thrilled that we defeated one of the top teams, or so they claimed. But as I said, it was just noise because we were just as skilled as the other playoff teams. We had earned our spot and deserved to be there. God had answered my prayer and we made it to the conference championships. Another tough game ensued and we emerged victorious, silencing all the doubters. I was overwhelmed with excitement and got on my knees to cry tears of joy. I couldn't wait to get home to Candace. We landed at two in the morning that Monday. I arrived home at 3.45 and although I thought she was asleep, she was on the couch. She ran to me and jumped with joy, and we shared a brief kiss before she looked into my eyes and said, congratulations. Thank you. You're just one game away from getting your prize. I know, and I can hardly wait, I said before we kissed again. It was our first kiss, and it was nice. I had to stop because I made a vow to remain abstinent until I'm married and said, mm, babe, babe, we have to stop. I don't mind at all. Well, I still have one more game to go. I don't want to spoil the special moment. Besides, I don't want to cheat, I said before giving her one last kiss and putting her down. She looked disappointed, but I had to keep my promise as much as I wanted it. We had two weeks to prepare ourselves for the big game. I did one last fasting before the big game. I got Candace a ticket close to the field because I wanted her close to me. I booked her in the same hotel we were staying at although I tried to stay away from her while we prepared. The night before the game, I went to see her in her room. We spent all night talking and fell asleep in the room with her. No, we didn't have sex. Anyway, people were talking, saying that our opponent was going to beat us by a landslide. They said that we made it to the Super Bowl by luck. I mean, can you believe it? They talked as if we didn't have any talent. Again, I had to cancel all this noise and negative energy. While we were warming up on the field, I listened to Lauren Daigle's I will trust in you and you say as my motivation. But Candace called me and she was upset. She had my jersey on while she went out to the store. She told me that a guy said to her that our team would be going home crying because we weren't good enough to win the Super Bowl. I said, baby, I know my God will not let me down. It's just noise. I want you to look sexy for me tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Look, I have to go. I love you. I love you too. See you soon. Okay, sweetie, bye, I said. I was also praying in my heart because I knew so many people were waiting for us to lose the game later. After our practice, the time approached for the game. We suited up and our coach talked to us and told us not to get nervous. He said, I need you guys to go out there and give your best performance. After he talked to us, I asked the guys to pray with me before we headed out. I have to say, it was a different vibe from all the games we've played. We were all excited to come to that point, and now it was up to us to bring that trophy home. We won the coin toss and let our opponent start. Let me tell you, I truly felt that God was on our side. The other quarterback I was playing against was well-known, had a great reputation, and was loved by many. It was like a David and Goliath type of thing because I was this third-string quarterback, not well-known, until I took over for Jake. Even after we won all these games, I was still under scrutiny and people decided that I wasn't good enough to compete. Everyone was expecting us to lose the game. So anyway, 
When the game started, on third down, Paul intercepted the ball and made a touchdown return. Boy, we needed that score, because that alone boosted our confidence. The defense showed up, and they went four and out the second time they had the ball. So, we got the ball on the 20-yard line and drove it to the goal line, and I threw a touchdown to Etienne. By the time we reached the end of the second quarter, we scored 31 points before going to halftime. And they only had three points. It got better when we started the third quarter, and we received the ball. Jonas was the receiver, and he returned it for a 99-yard touchdown. They had the ball and reached the goal line, but they fumbled. We managed to secure three points from that fumble, but they scored a touchdown at the end of the third quarter. I went four and out and had to give the ball back, but when we regained possession, we swiftly scored a touchdown. The score was 48 to 17. With just five minutes left in the fourth quarter, we added three more points, making it 51 to 17. As I watched the clock run down to zero, I was filled with disbelief and overwhelming excitement. I dropped to my knees in the middle of the field, raising both my hands towards heaven, thanking God for hearing my prayers. The guys celebrated with me, and the field was flooded with joy. After getting up, I exchanged handshakes with my opponents and then rushed to the sideline to find my future wife, Candace. When I saw her, I couldn't hold back the tears because, after God, she is the reason why I won the Super Bowl. She jumped on my neck, and I spun around with her before kissing her and saying, I love you so much. I had already purchased an engagement ring to propose to her. I wanted to do it live because I was sure that her ex-husband was watching, so he could see me proposing to her. She didn't expect it. Once the lady who was supposed to bring the flowers and the ring came to me and brought them, I got on my knees and asked her to marry me. It was a magical and joyous day, filled with blessings. We celebrated all night because it was surreal that we had won the Super Bowl. I didn't go to bed until five in the morning. I went to Candace's room and she had some sexy see-through lingerie on waiting for me. I walked in, closed the door and took a good look at her enjoying the scenery before she walked up to me to undress me. And I said, sweetie, as much as I want this, I'm gonna have to say no for tonight. She looked confused at me and said, why? Wasn't it part of the deal? It was, but I vowed to remain abstinent until we are married. I kissed her and continue. So, start planning our wedding so we can get married soon. She pulled away with disappointment and was going to take the lingerie off and said, what are you doing? You say you don't want to sleep with me. I said that I'm not going to have sex with you tonight until we are married. I never said that I want you to take them off. Besides, I'm sleeping here tonight, I said. I walked to her and started kissing her. We got into bed. I was lying behind her. I put the pillow in front of my private. She turned, looked at me and said, just because we're not having sex doesn't mean that I can't feel you. She removed the pillow and snuggled against me. Turning to face me, she asked, are you really a virgin? I smiled, gazing into her eyes and replied, Hmm, what do you think? She shook her head, saying, I don't know. I can't fully figure you out, Logan. I'll tell you what, I said, leaning in to kiss her. You'll find out on our honeymoon. Fair enough. We talked and eventually fell asleep around seven in the morning. As we were packing to leave, there was a knock on my door. I thought it was Candace, but to my surprise, it was Etienne. He asked, did you sleep with my aunt? I was taken aback, replying, what? Don't lie to me, man. Some of the guys saw you coming out of a room earlier, he said, his anger evident. I glanced at Kai, who mouthed, it wasn't me. I'm dating her, but I didn't sleep with her, I stated. I wasn't sure how he found out. And just then Candace arrived, asking, what's going on? Etienne's anger was apparent as he responded, I thought we were friends, man. I retorted, oh, because we're friends, I can't date or sleep with your aunt? No, you can't date my aunt because you're gay, but you won't admit it, he said angrily. I was left in confusion by this accusation, but before I could respond, Candace stepped in saying, that was inappropriate, Etienne, and I don't appreciate you calling my fiance gay. Just because he's not behaving promiscuously like you doesn't make him gay. He's a respectful man who values the principles of marriage, something you know very little about. Perhaps you should learn from him instead of sleeping around like you do. This man loves and respects me. He could have taken advantage of me, unlike your friends here, but he didn't. 
I was left speechless by her defense and felt a deeper love for her. Etienne seemed to act as if I had taken his girlfriend from him, which left me wondering about his feelings for his aunt. After their departure, I expressed my gratitude to Candace, saying, I'm so glad I met you. Me too, she replied, adding, I'm going to finish packing. Don't let them get to you, okay? I won't, I assured her before she left the room. Etienne later apologized to me while we were on the plane heading home, and I accepted his apology. Two months later, Candace and I got married. I told her about the vow to give $100,000 and she opened a nonprofit organization to help orphans and the homeless. We also began trying to have children of our own. I put plans to purchase a home on hold, since I wasn't sure where I would be playing next season. The front office had Jake as their quarterback, and I wasn't certain they'd be willing to pay me what I was worth, even after winning the Super Bowl. I had made it clear in my interviews that I was open to any team willing to sign me. Three months after our wedding, I was lounging on the couch, watching television while my wife prepared lunch. My phone started ringing and I noticed it was my agent, David. I picked up and he said, did you tell people that you're leaving the team? I sat up and replied, no. Reporters asked and I said I was open to any team that wants to give me a job. Okay, the front office wants to see you now. Can you come right away? I'm on my way there. Okay, I answered before hanging up. I looked at my wife and, and she said, is everything okay? I said, I don't know. David just told me that the front office wants to see me. I'm heading there now. I got up, grabbed my car keys, kissed her, and left to meet David at the office, not knowing what to expect. I feared I might be released because they favored Jake. When I arrived at the front office, David was already there, and we went to the conference room where they were waiting for me. I thought, this is it, I'm getting fired. I sat down and the general manager asked, how is married life? It's been great, I replied. He then looked at Coach Derek and asked, did you want to say anything before I start? Coach Derek replied, no, go ahead. The general manager, Pete, continued, well, we've been discussing the incredible effort you and the team put into winning the Super Bowl, something we've been working toward for years. We're pleased to have the trophy here, and the city thanks you but we can't keep all three of you on the roster. As soon as I heard that, I thought, I'm glad I didn't buy that house yet. Pete went on, I heard that you've expressed an interest in leaving our organization, so I spoke with all the coaching staff and we've all agreed that it would be best to make you our franchise quarterback if you agree to the salary terms we have to offer. He slid the contract over to me. I took it, read through the details, and saw that they were offering me a four-year contract for $160 million, with $130 million guaranteed. I sat in the chair, stunned and overwhelmed with joy. I couldn't wait to get home and share the news with my wife. I had never dreamed of making so much money in my lifetime. After signing the contract, I returned home, still in disbelief. I opened the door and my wife was sitting on the couch. She noticed the look on my face and asked, Baby, are you all right? I stood there, still looking at her, and she got up, walked over to me, and asked, What happened? I kissed her briefly and said, I owe you everything. After God, you are the reason for my success. I kissed her again and continued, Baby, your husband just signed a contract for $160 million. I'm now the franchise quarterback of the team for the next four years. Thank you, baby. She had a mischievous look on her face, and I said, What? You want to go have sex? Yes, but there's something I need to tell you, she said. I looked at her in confusion and asked, Oh no, you have your period. She replied, No, I don't think I'm going to have my period for the next six months. I looked at her, still puzzled, and said, What do you mean? I'm pregnant. You did it, babe, she said, beaming. Yes, yes, I told you, I exclaimed, showering her with kisses. When we went to the doctor to confirm, we found out she was carrying twins. Since I wanted a big family, and with the raise I had received, I bought my wife a seven-bedroom house with a three-car garage and got her a new car. I couldn't help but thank God for all the blessings in my life. No part of this book may be copied or stored in a retrieval system without the author's permission. If you enjoyed the story, 
please give it a thumbs up and feel free to comment with your thoughts or suggestions. Remember to subscribe and click the notification button for upcoming stories. Thank you for watching.